Welcome to 7 Investing Now, a show that teaches you how to take a long-term view on investing by better understanding what's happening in the market now. Good afternoon, 7 Investors, and welcome to the Wednesday edition of 7 Investing Now. My name, of course, is Daniel Brooks Klein. I'm the host of the program. I'm being joined today live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania by Max Chatsko and from Houston, Texas, or the, at least the greater Houston area by Dana Abramovitz. Dana, is it possible your power goes out at any minute? What is going on with uh, power usage and rolling blackouts in Texas? Well, you know, so it actually rained last night, so the temperatures cooled down quite a bit. So I think that that's, that's good. But um, yeah. It, it, okay. rain, it, it, rained, it rained here in West Palm Beach yesterday. So I decided uh, that'd be a good time to take a walk. It was not. It was like taking a walk, like, you know, in the sauna when you throw the water and all the steam comes up. I felt like I was on like Dagobah. Like that is a Star Wars reference if, if for those of you who don't notice. It was unbelievably uncomfortable. Uh, Max, are you going to try to avoid sneezing on this show? Is there, is there a story you want to tell there? <laughs> yeah. So I had some uh, temporary crowns put in last week and uh, over the weekend I sneezed and my tooth shot across my living room. So uh, hopefully I don't sneeze on the show, Dan. And for those of you who don't know, Max hasn't brushed his teeth in 23 years. No, Max got punched in the face. That is why, through no fault of his own, that is why he has crowns and is dealing with this stuff. But we aren't going to talk about dental work all that much today. We're going to talk about healthcare. We are going to answer a lot of your questions. You shared a lot of questions about healthcare with us on Twitter, but we'd also like to see your live questions about healthcare. So if there's anything you're thinking, uh, we will try to answer that. But before we do that, our top story is gonna be what I'm calling four big questions on healthcare. I don't know why, I think it's the Jewish upbringing. It's always four questions. We are, <laughs> we are sort of taught that four is the correct number of questions. Uh, that is a little bit of an inside baseball joke for those of you who are not Jewish. Uh, look it up, look up four questions, not a big deal. Uh, but let's start with Dana. And Max, you could chime in as well here on this one. Has the pandemic changed anything about how Americans view healthcare? Dana. So I, I, I think so, right? Um, so telehealth and telemedicine has definitely taken off um, as a result of um, the pandemic. Um, you know, it was it was in place, right? So there had been a lot of policy changes to kind of deal with all of that. But, um, you know, I think that that, you know, it, it, it was easy to do. And, and now, you know, I think people like it. It's convenient, right? So, you know, healthcare is becoming more, much more consumer focused. And hopefully the regulators will um, let us keep it and, <laughs> and just make sure that it gets reimbursed. Yeah, um, I, I I have to say, I'll never go back. And I don't mean, obviously, for some things, you have to go to the doctor. Sure. But if I'm having an allergic reaction to something I know I'm allergic to and know what the treatment has been in the past, I'm absolutely jumping on telemedicine. If, if uh, my wife has strep throat and I come down with strep-like symptoms, I am going to go to a teledoc appointment. It is unbelievably convenient. And I don't know anyone who said, you know what I wish I could do? spend more time in a waiting room, spend more time in <laughs> traffic. Max, there's no teledental, uh, but let me ask kind of a follow-up question here to you. From an investing point of view, do you think platform is gonna matter? Because I question quite a bit uh, whether anyone knows that they're on Teladoc or any other specific platform. My wife's insurance uses some other platform and it seems fine. I've gone direct through Teladoc, I liked it, but. I don't actually know that there's anything proprietary about any of this for the most part. Am I, am I missing something? Yeah, that might be true. I've never used telemedicine and this isn't really like an area I cover, but uh, I live in Pittsburgh and here we have the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC. So this giant regional and actually all across the state now, uh, medical center, right? So all the hospitals here are like UPMC for the most part. You can have insurance through UPMC. They have their own telemedicine apps. So like you never have to leave the UPMC ecosystem. And I'm sure that's very true uh, in other major metropolitan areas, Pittsburgh's not a major metropolitan area. Let's not joke around. Um, <laughs> but, um, so yeah, maybe it, it seems more like a, almost a commodity really, right? Like it comes down to like relationships and, and connections to, uh, to doctors and things. Yeah. And there's obviously some technology can be better than others. I've, but even when it's not great, like I, I just went to some random one when my son needed allergy medicine, when we we're in Florida, um, 
it worked fine. It asked a little more probing sort of dumb questions that maybe if I'd gone through our health insurance, maybe that information would have been pre-populated, but I did it by first finding a 24 hour drugstore rather than going directly through our, which is not a thing most places, but in the Orlando area uh, and maybe Las Vegas, 24 hour drugstores are a thing. Uh, we're gonna go to the second question here. We would love to see your questions, your comments, say hello, tell us a joke, whatever it is in the comments section live. Uh, Dana, we're going to talk in a second about the special report you wrote uh, for people who'd uh, love to share their email address with 7investing. But before we do that, let's touch on the, the subject matter. Uh, what role will big tech be playing in healthcare? I know they're all trying. I'm wearing an Apple Watch, but it's it's limited. Um, do you, I, I know you're pretty skeptical about this compared to most people. Yeah. So you know, coming from the healthcare industry, right? I, I, I would love for technology to help um, the healthcare industry. It's just that um, a lot of technology tries to apply itself to the industry without really understanding, um, you know, how things work. And that just makes things really complicated. And so, you know, a lot of tech giants have tried and failed because they don't really understand um, the healthcare system and working from within the system. Dana, do you think it's more likely that they can disrupt the health insurance model? So we're seeing a couple of big tech companies, and I, and I won't name them to not favor anyone over the other, that are essentially using a model that mixes telehealth and in-person nurses where they're not so much upsetting the, the health apple cart as they are changing how they're paying for care for their workers. Is that type of model sort of more likely because it kind of works adjacent to the uh, existing system? It, it, all, it all has to work together. Right. I mean, it, it really does. Right. Because, you know, I mean, if you go, a, a hospital has hundreds of workers and their job is just to no, negotiate insurance contracts, like hundreds of people in their finance department just to negotiate those contracts. So until all of that changes. Right. So insurance has to change. The healthcare system has to change. Um, it, it, everybody needs to work together. And that's why it's not just one hammer to, you know, hammer on, on this particular nail. You really need to understand the system and, and work through the, the whole web, uh, intricate web that it is. Yeah, I actually think we're seeing this a number of different ways. I actually have a friend who, not a friend, but someone I went to high school with that I know a little bit, uh, who started his own, I don't know what you call it, like healthcare club. He's a doctor. You pay a monthly fee to him and he'll provide all the services you he can provide, but only up to a point. So that works in this model where a lot of people have very high deductibles and their standard for being willing to go to a hospital is pretty high. So joining something like that, and that's sort of where I see the big tech disruption. Max, don't feel you have to have an opinion here, but is there anything you want to add here? No, I think Dana's report hits it on the head. And um, you oh, know, why don't you promote Dana's report and explain how it works <laughs> and, how, and how people can get it? I actually don't know how it works. To be honest, I don't want to give people bad information. But uh, her report is on you know can big tech or can tech disrupt healthcare and change healthcare? Uh, basically, you know what she just said, but she lays out all the details and has some anecdotes as well in the report. Um, so I definitely recommend reading it. Dan, why don't you explain how people can go and find it? <laughs> oh, I should know that answer. Sam Bailey, if uh, if you want to turn on your audio and explain how this works. So basically, Dana wrote a, a massive report that digs into all this. How many, how many words did you come out with, Dana? So it's not massive, massive. It's like enjoyable reading. It's, it's <laughs> you know, like informative. It's not like, you know, a thesis. It's not, you know, several volumes. It's, it's, it's manageable. We are very excited to share this. We will try to get the info as to where you can give us your email address, where this is available for members. Probably should have had that. And there's Sam Bailey. Oh, hello, I'm here, partner. not audio. I couldn't get on only audio. So I'm Sam, how do you get our new special report? So if you are not a subscriber, just go to 7investing.com and there is a gray box right on the homepage that says, can technology fix healthcare? You click that button, you give us your email address and it will be in your email within a couple minutes. Very easy. And it's an excellent report, Dana. You did a great job. 
I will you. point out that we don't send you a ton of email if you're not a member. If you're a member, we send very select emails and we're working on some tools that allow you to really sign up for exactly what emails you want. But we are not a company where if you give us your email, you're going to wake up every day to like three emails from us. I'm looking at you, musicians, friend. I bought something 12 <laughs> years ago. I've hit unsubscribe. <laughs> Take me off your mailing list. We see some questions and comments. We would happily get to those later in the show. But let's move to question three on our four big questions about healthcare. Has anything changed about how you view investing in drug developers slash biotech slash healthcare with so much speculative money pushing up valuations? Yes, Max, this question was written for you. Yeah, I've been talking about this, um, you know, so, so this in the last 18 months, um, obviously the stock market's been very, uh, doing very well. And, you know, it's just different in, in when you're investing in a drug developer compared to say a tech company, you know, a tech company has revenue, sometimes it even has earnings and cash flow. And even if it has a premium associated with the stock or the valuation, you can kind of like squint your eyes and tilt your head and look at instead of next year, you can look into two years or three years out in the future. And you can kind of justify investing in that. When it comes to biotech or drug developers, um, you know, they don't have revenue, they don't have earnings, they don't have cash flow, if it's a, a, a development stage uh, drug developer. So the way that we value a drug developer is we take, you know, the assets in the pipeline, and we can assign certain probabilities of success to each stage of development, you need to multiply those together. There's all these other, there's a lot of weird math here when you're doing the uh, risk adjusted net present value calculations for a drug developer. So I won't get into all that. Um, but the probability of success that an asset moves from phase one, clinical trials and eventually gets approved across the entire industry is less than 10%. It's 9.6%. So when I see a lot of these development stage drug companies and they're valued in the billions of dollars, which is highly unusual uh, in, in a pre pandemic world or stock market, um, it does kind of concern me. You know, there's some, like a lot of the CRISPR companies, there's a lot of excitement there, but some of these don't have any data at all. Some aren't even in clinical trials yet. And they're valued at like $6 billion or more. That's uh, we're assigning a very high probability of success, probably an unrealistic probability of success. Um, and, and that's going to set some of these companies up for disappointment, you know, when maybe there's mixed results, which happen all the time. Some some endpoints can be successful. Some cannot. There's going to be better things than first generation CRISPR gene editing. Uh, and, and that's not just CRISPR. This, this kind of I see this really broadly across the industry. So um, it does concern me. And, and I would say you need to be more cautious around valuation risks if you're uh, investing in this space right now. I think you also want to avoid getting caught up in the hype. This is sort of one of those markets where it's the old pitch line of, oh, we could be the Chipotle for Chinese food. <laughs> and if we only capture 2% of the market, we'll be billion. Well, yeah, it's hard to capture 2% of the market. And even if your drug works, and this is something Max ha ha has drilled into me, even if your drug works, doesn't mean it's gonna be the best drug, doesn't mean insurance is gonna cover it, doesn't mean the pricing is gonna make sense, doesn't mean doctors will prescribe it. Uh, I have a cousin who is a drug rep and, and he has what he would argue is a better drug in the field uh, that he works in than the industry standard. The problem is insurance companies have to agree with that and maybe they don't quite as much. Uh, and that's not always based on efficacy. That's that's often based on, on political reasons and, and, and other things. So there are a lot of roadblocks that could impact this. We're gonna get to your questions and comments, but we've got one more question here. Do you think it's possible that there will be major disruption in US healthcare? W what would that even look like? Dana, you're up first on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's 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 uh, that that's a tough one, and you know you'd you'd like to see um, that disruption, um, but you know a, a lot of things um, play a part in that. Um, so yeah, it, you know, and, and it's it's not just it's not just one thing. Yeah, there there are a ton of things that that go into this. Um, the biggest obvious, well, it's. Someone asked the question, so I'll, 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 I'll raise the question right now. If you want to pull up, Sam, the, uh, the top comment we have there, uh, that sort of speaks to this, is uh, yeah. can the system really be disrupted without an act of Congress? Um, yeah. And oh, go ahead. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I stepped in there. I was just going to say, I do think there are parts of it that can be disrupted, that there is, you know, technology to... You know, we, we're going to talk about Apple later, but technology to monitor various important 
things that right now are difficult to monitor could disrupt some aspect of healthcare. You may not have to go in to say, get a blood pressure check because we might get incredibly accurate blood pressure that comes from your watch or a very affordable device. There are home devices, they're, they're, they're not particularly great. So there, there's absolutely some disruption that could happen, but the overall system of health insurance has been dictated by government. And while you see things like, I don't know, faith-based healthcare coalitions and, and doctors starting up, you know, sort of uh, co-ops and collectives, there are, those, those are gonna be minor disruptions. We really would need some sort of massive government in, intervention. Dana, yeah. it's not gonna happen right now, but oh, I'm sorry, I stepped in you again, jump in here. No, no, I was, I was, you know, and, and I, I kind of touch on it in that special report. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, part of the problem is, you know, a lot of the reimbursement, you know, like all the FDA, you know, CMS, so the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, right? So they do all the reimbursement. Um, and a lot of the things that they do are dictated um, or, or, you know, carried out by all the private insurers. Um, and, you know, we can't have... Um, you know, like one administ you know, every four years, we can't cycle through, you know, something else because we have a different administration and, you know, we have different people in Congress that are, are setting the standards. So it does, it needs to, you know, become this long-term thing because the hospital systems are not going to change their practice every four years. I mean, that's, you know, we had that, right? They refused to make changes because they knew that it was going to change, right? And it's too much work for them to, you know, re-steer the ship into something else, um, only to change it back. I mean, they can't, they can't do that. Healthcare is not that agile. Um, they, they just don't take risk and um, they don't change quickly. So we need some Thing that's going to be um, steady so that that change can be adopted. Max, I'll give you the last word here. Yeah, it's very complex, right? It's like one of these problems that we didn't do anything about for too long. And now it's this big, hairy, complicated thing. And there's no really easy solution. And I think there's going to have to be multiple solutions to different problems within, you know, this big, giant black box that is American healthcare. But, uh, there's a lot of things that could change. Um, you know, there's too many, too much abstraction, whether it's insurance or payments, or I go to the hospital and then I go to another one, three blocks away and it costs three X difference for some reason. It's the same procedure. It just, a lot of it doesn't make sense. It's unnecessarily complicated. I, I don't even know. No, I'm not going to comment. There's no way to comment on this without being political. I, I I'll just say that I think the biggest issue is there has to be a will. There has to be an, an actual desire to do things differently. And I think that that starts with the notion of does everyone deserve health care? And that's something we, whatever your politics are, we have not been able to agree on as a country. And that's where disruption would come from. I am coming close to a line. So Dana, if you wanted to weigh uh, in, so go I, ahead. I, I, I just wanted to add that, you know, I, I think that a lot of the new medical, or some of the new medical schools or a lot of the doctors that are coming through the, the, the medical school pipeline now um, are you know, starting to incorporate, um, you know, technology, um, this disruptive thinking. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the next, you know, the new generations of physicians um, are going to, to make these changes. And if I could add more, like, you know, this was a big part of Dan's report was like, if we just thought of healthcare as value-based care, you know, like, what is the actual outcome? And is that, is that resulting in value for the patient or the healthcare system? Like, that's what, you should get paid based on that, not just because insurance will cover it. Um, and maybe additionally, you know, we should focus more on our lifestyles and, and little changes we can all make. Um, we have this like drug first mentality here in the, in the United States. Um, so like type two diabetes, for instance, you can reverse type two diabetes uh, with diet and exercise changes. It's a lifestyle disease. It doesn't exist otherwise. Um, but we want to give you insulin or now there's companies developing all these crazy complicated antibodies that are going to cost tens of thousands of dollars a year. And like you could, you could fix that problem yourself, but we don't have a healthcare system that encourages that. Yeah, you can make meaningful changes, and and I, and I'll and I'll lean on Max and uh, Dana join us later. But the the pandemic made me somewhat sedentary. I was still seeing my trainer outside, but the workouts weren't as useful. Uh, so that was just maintaining at best on a strength basis. And after a while, I wasn't walking to Starbucks and getting my my ten thousand steps in, and I'd sort of plateaued on walking anyway, because I wasn't pushing myself. So, you know, about, I don't know what it is, six, seven months ago, 
I started making a very concerted effort to do things like monitor my heart rate and make sure I'm getting enough movement every day at a high rate. And, and I'll say, we're gonna talk about the Apple Watch later. My Apple Watch, as I've gotten more fit, has raised the standards of what it considers exercise. So yes, I might get a minute of exercise if I walk up two flights of stairs. I have two 18 step staircases in my house. That, that is absolutely you know exercise. Your heart rate goes way up. But when I go take a walk, until I've pushed my heart rate to a certain level, which now takes longer, maybe the first 10, 12 minutes of my walk isn't going to, to actually be exercise. It's movement, that's great, but it, it, it doesn't count. So it's a raising bar. And I put in a real solid effort to like, what, what food choices can I make that, that are not that disruptive, but are subtly different? And we've talked about this, Max, that I'm only eating red meat once a week. I'm trying to eat you know, more fish and more things that I like that are just frankly a little harder to cook uh, you know, and, and a little more, more, you know, yeah, you can buy a steak and have it sit around for two or three days. You don't want to do that with shrimp or, or, or salmon. So, you know, I, I've been spending more money on that sort of thing, but sort of looking at myself as an investment. And there have been absolutely tangible benefits in, in things that even I can measure, uh, you know, in terms of, of blood pressure and heart rate and all that type of thing. We would love your questions and comments. Uh, there's one in there from, uh, from Gareth Simons. Uh, Gareth, if you want to provide a little more explanation or send us an email at info at seveninvesting.com, I'm not sure we understand what you're looking for there. Uh, and we would appreciate any questions you have. You can also ask some general investing ones. We'll get to those if you like. But let before we hit our vast array of questions you shared with us on Twitter, and thank you for doing that, um, let's share a little bit about what happens on Friday. If you're a member of Seven Investing, first of all, if you're a new member, at 10 a.m. we host our new member call. During the new member call, we walk you through how the service works. We walk you through even how to buy a stock, sort of some basic philosophy points. Um, you know, I'm gonna share, share recipe. No, we're not gonna do that, but we are gonna tell you everything you need to know about the service. Then at 11 o'clock, we are going to do our members call. This is a free for all. We're, we're gonna update our most recent picks. We're gonna update some picks we really wanna talk about. Uh, and then we're gonna take your questions. And that's a forum where you can ask us about things that are seven investing recommendations. And we don't actively talk about that kind of thing here on seven investing. Now, then at 1230, we will have a special seven investing now with most, if not all members of the team, uh, probably all of us uh, except Honor Bon, and sometimes Dana has to come in and out for other reasons, but we'll get as many people on as we can. After that, in the afternoon, we record our, our videos uh, for, for the pitches you see when, when our new picks come out. So it is a very busy Friday. And if you wanna be able to access all of that, uh, the, the new member call, the subscriber call, if you want to access those things, you have to be a member. And the added benefit, if you go to 7investing.com slash subscribe of joining now is right now through July 7th, our price is $17 a month or $170 a year. On July 8th, our price goes to $49 a month or $399 a year. But if you sign up before July 7th, you get the old pricing, the, the original pricing locked in forever. So when, when Max Chasco's head in a jar is doing this show in 2,135, you will still be paying $17 a month, which with inflation, that would probably be a really, really good deal. Even if the Fed keeps inflation in check for the next hundred and whatever years that would be. Let's pivot into taking a bunch of your questions. I'm excited for this segment. I was surprised at how much uh, Twitter reaction we got yesterday. The summer has been a little bit weird and slow in terms of some of the interactive parts here, but let's take the first question from Ray Al. If you wanna share that one, Sam Bailey. Uh, I can't get myself to invest in any of the biotech stocks because I don't understand them as well as high growth tech stocks. I do see the need to diversify into high growth biotech. Would an ETF serve better? Max Chasco, I know you wanna answer this one. Yeah, so I think the answer is simple, Rayal. Um, you don't need to diversify into areas that you don't know and understand, right? Just stick to what you know. It's kind of what investing is all about. Um, so I have the opposite quote problem as you. I don't actually understand tech. I don't know what metrics matter. I don't know what the valuations mean. I don't understand the competitive landscape. So I don't own any tech stocks. I'm pretty much, I'm pr very heavily invested in drug developers and I own some energy stocks as well. Um, so you don't have to, you said, you, you know, the need to diversify, there's no need to diversify into other areas. Um, you can diversify within the areas, you know, I mean, we say tech stocks, that's pretty broad, right? There's cloud, there's uh, uh, software as a service. There's all kinds of crazy things like little industries. If you want to get into all the nuance of it and drug development's the same way. So 
um, it can be, you can get into more trouble if you feel the need to diversify into areas you don't understand. So Max, I'll jump in that I don't think there's a need to diversify, but if you are a seven investing member, which I believe Rayal is, uh, I would look at if you wanna have exposure to other spaces, I trust Max. I buy all of Max's recommendations. I've bought some of Dana's recommendations. Uh, it hasn't been here that long, so there aren't that many recommendations. Um, you know, so I think if you want exposure to other things, taking the word of someone you trust and putting a little investment across their, their two or three highest conviction stocks, which we talk about in the member calls, I don't think that's a bad idea. I've purchased some things that I don't fully understand simply because I watched Steve Stymington or Simon Erickson be so passionate about it. And you know, that doesn't come up as much with Matt Cochran because our, our, our interests overlap. But if there's something that like I just sort of liked and he really likes it, I might take a deeper look. I've kind of stopped having a number on my portfolio. Like my own personal picks, I might limit that to, to, to whatever the number is I consider I can actively track and manage. Uh, even that's easier to do for me because it's my job to track and manage stocks so I can put more time in than other people. But I own a bunch of things like, like you know, Max you know, asked me a question about a stock and I had to look if I to see if I owned it. Uh, and the answer is I did because because at some point it was it was something he picked. You don't have to understand why you own every stock. Now you could understand it by reading Max's report, or you could just say, this is a person who knows this space. I'd like 5% of my portfolio to have exposure to that space because I, I think in a broad sense, there's upside there. You can understand that there's going to be big growth in biotech without understanding which companies are the best ones. Let us continue and move on here. Uh, we will take the next one from Surin, uh, if you want to throw that one up, Sam. Uh, what's the outlook like for other Alzheimer's drugs in development? Biogen was a, was a good long, but given the backlash and high-ranking FDA officials uh, resigning, what's the view on the other companies? Yeah, the Biogen was very confusing. This feels to me like maybe they shouldn't have approved it. Uh, and I know the actual language was, was stricter, but uh, Max, I'll go to you. And I promise, Dana, we'll get back to you soon. Um, yeah, so just with the Biogen stuff, um, you know, so the uh, FDA uh, gave it a conditional approval. So the company still has to run a confirmatory trial. Some people criticize the timeline. It has until like 2090 to run that trial or whatever. Then they came out and priced their drug at $56,000 a year when, you know, um, uh, an independent agency said, hey, this probably has a fair value at like $8,000 maximum. Um, and then we don't actually have evidence that it works. I think that's the important part. And the hypothesis, the beta amyloid hypothesis that those plaques build up in the brain actually cause Alzheimer's um, is not proven. We don't actually have any good evidence that removing those plaques improves cognitive abilities. I mean, in fact, those uh, plaques build up in areas of the brain that are not associated with memory. So it's kind of an interesting point. Uh, so the FDA should be criticized. I almost hope it does kind of revoke this approval. The FDA actually doesn't even have a permanent commissioner right now. And most of the independent advisory committee that voted against it, it was like 10 uh, 10 of the 11 in the uh, the independent advisory committee members voted against approving this. Um, the other person abstained or was uncertain, I think, was their vote. So like overwhelmingly, they said, don't approve this. The FDA said, no, nah, we're going to approve it. And now they're in this, uh, you know, you know what storm here. So uh, but Dana, I mean, what is, uh, you know, where are we with Alzheimer's and the FDA? And, and you know, what, what, give us a little bit of background. Yeah, well, uh, so Alzheimer's is, is a really difficult um, <clears throat> disease to you know, to understand. And, and you're right, you know, so targeting the, those amyloid plaques, um, you know, it's just a hypothesis that that's actually going to, um, you know, fix it. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to know and it's, it's hard to, you know, test and really understand the disease. So that's kind of problematic as well, right? Because you, Dana is fading in and out of the brain and, um, you know, Oh, sorry. I, no, Can I you think hear it's me your now? internet connection, which we've all okay. which we've all fallen victim to at different points. Uh, finally, I, I I now have fiber here, so when I'm at home, my internet connection is good. But as you all know, I'm going to be on the road quite a bit, so this is something that's going to happen to all of us. So let let me explain this, and Max, jump in if I'm wrong. Basically, what this drug does is it's shown that it can reverse some of the plaques. Uh, on the brain, which might be what causes Alzheimer's. But it is also possible that, yes, it can do that, but the end result isn't fixing Alzheimer's. So 
it, just because what these things might relate, be related, getting rid of it doesn't necessarily lead to an improvement. Is that an accurate way to describe this? Oh, and Max appears to be. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> and this is the most important thing is that the company Biogen doesn't actually have data that the drug works and it was still approved. Like the trials that were conducted, it wasn't a phase three clinical trial. Uh, they don't have very robust data sets and the FDA still approved it. So that's also like the very uh, controversial aspect of this because it lessens the standards of the FDA. It suggests that it's not actually safeguarding uh, patients or citizens of the United States. Um, so there's there's this behind the scenes, there was this, uh, you know, um, nonprofit for Alzheimer's care that kind of like strong armed the FDA into approving it. And we don't want that to happen. Right. Because a lot of those are funded by companies like Biogen. Um, so, you know, we can see the need that like there's patients out there that have nothing. There's no treatments. Right. So we want to help them. But we also don't want them to pay crazy amounts of money for something that doesn't actually work. Right. That's the most important part. Um, so with the price that Biogen set, uh, most patients, all patients will have to spend over $10,000 every year out of pocket and it might not even work. I mean, that's unacceptable. I think that's not the healthcare system, uh, that I want to live within. Max, could this been, could this have been handled with a, a compassionate care, uh, exception? Like, are, aren't they allowed to, if, if your prognosis is bleak, let you try things that might not work. I, I know I have an uncle in a in a prostate cancer uh, treatment like that, where it's worked really effectively for him, but has not worked for most people in the trial. I don't, I don't know. Maybe Dana can weigh in there. But with Alzheimer's affects six million individuals, so it's it's a much larger than like a. Usually, we do that for like rare diseases where there's really nothing you can do, and we can at least <laughs> manage Alzheimer's, um, not like cancers or things that are maybe more fatal, right? Uh, Dana, I don't know how that works with compassionate use. Yeah. Well, so I, th I think you're right that it is, um, and can you hear me? Um, mm -hmm. It is more, um, you know, just uh, like a, la a last effort, you know, and, and it's possible that that's why they went ahead and proved it, that there was a lot of advocacy um, by patient groups to, you know, give them something. Um, but, you know, that, um, you know, the, the something is still not known, right? So, um, and and expecting people to pay that that price point for it, I'm just, I agree with Max, it's just kind of crazy. Yeah, at that price, it should come with a two bedroom apartment in Manhattan. Like what is <laughs> what is going on there? We're gonna take Rob question, Rob's question next. We appreciate uh, the questions you are asking in the queue. If, if we ignore something, it's either because we don't know the company or we don't have like really a direct way to answer. Of course, the ones we got from Twitter, we have a little bit more time uh, to research and figure it out. So we appreciate those of you watching at home and playing along. We often share questions through the at seven investing Twitter handle uh, that we're gonna talk about on the show. I'll give you a heads up now. We're gonna do that for Friday's show. So any questions you wanna ask any member of the team, watch the seven investing Twitter handle and I will share a call for questions. Uh, but if you wanna throw up Rob's comment, Sam, we would appreciate that. Uh, would love to hear a Nano X update. Uh, what to look for in the coming quarters. Wow, um, there's, there's no update here, right, Max? Like nothing has happened. Yeah, so the company, um, I don't know, a few months ago uh, announced that the FDA had cleared its single source imaging device. Um, so uh, that's gonna use, be used in tomosynthesis. So things like uh, maybe detecting tumors and like, you know, for breast cancer or something, right? Those types of applications. However, the company's software is still not cleared by the FDA. And the single source device isn't actually what the company is going to use as its commercial device. It's going to license that out if it uses it at all. Um, also important, everyone's excited about Nanomex imaging because of the medical screening as a service business model, which means it needs to have its software cleared by the FDA, which hasn't happened yet. So right now it has like one clearance out of three that it needs. Um, the other two are, according to the company, expected to be announced uh, before the end of calendar 2021. Um, but the company, you know, needs those clearances. It needs to have software approved. It needs to manufacture its devices, which it hasn't done yet. It needs to distribute them. Uh, still a, a pretty big uphill climb here. This was like a, a favorite on FinTwit and uh, lots of excitement and hype. Uh, so far, though, um, you know, a lot, a lot that needs to be proven here before we get too excited about it. Yeah, I have a napkin sketch of a reusable space car <laughs> that can take you to Mars in 45 right. minutes. Th throw me some investing money. I, I don't want to... I don't want to be too facetious here. This is obviously a company a lot of people are excited about, 
but please realize how long the road is and how you, you, when you're buying something speculative, you're not going to get daily news on it. We've talked a lot about this when on some of the riskier picks we've made that I'll have people on, on some picks I've made congratulate me. Wow, it's up 30%. And I'll say to them, well, but yeah, it's up 30% for no reason. None of the milestones have happened. Uh, and, and we've seen, uh, you know, in the stock market, we talked Virgin Galactic a few days ago, and Virgin Galactic has cleared some milestones. So if you're an investor in that company and it can put a rocket into space without it blowing up and, and everything works, well, that, that is a really good checklist. So it might make, and, you know, Max has, has talked a lot about this. When you hit these different milestones, it, it, they're de-risking events. It starts to make the stock better. But if you're going to get in really early, it is going to be an absolute long road. We're going to take a question from me. I wanted to make sure this got in. Uh, so I asked it on Twitter so Dana and Max can have time to think about I'd actually like to know how you feel about Apple saying that the next Apple Watch will be able to measure temperature and blood sugar. Is that a breakthrough for diabetics? Does it disrupt other tech uh, that's just for that? So before I let you guys answer it, I just want to say I'm excited about the temperature part of it because we've obviously been with uh, temperature theater with those incredibly un ineffective uh, temperature checks like when you walk in to get your hair cut or, or different places. I would love for my watch to be able to figure out my body norms and say, hey, Dan, I think you're running a fever. That would be useful information, even if it was just somewhat anecdotal, uh, like the heartbeat information and other things. But Dana, it is a very big leap to go from that to being doing something like like testing blood sugar, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, it's not new technology, right? There are many companies that have been trying to to measure um, blood sugar without a finger stick. Um, it's really hard, right? And, you know, it's it's interesting, um, you know, if, if Apple does this, right, it, is it a novelty, right? Is it just, you know, an interesting piece of information or does it become a medical device? And if it becomes a medical device, then it actually needs to be regulated like a medical device. And I'm not sure if that's something that Apple is, you know, really thinking about and, and stepping into. I, I think they're thinking about it. I don't think the first iteration of this is going to have it. And there might be, and I, I don't know, I am not a doctor. I have zero training in this space but there might be some beneficial reasons uh, to know my blood sugar heading into a workout. There, there might be some, some things like the way I track my heart rate uh, for you know, being in the right exercise zone. There might be some things that are way a step below uh, using it to track. But I do think five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever it is, Apple does want this to be a medical device and they will probably figure out how to go through the, those clearances. Um, Max, do you have any thoughts on this one? Do you, do you wear a smartwatch or, or a watch or, or one of those clocks around your neck like Flavor Flav? How do you tell time, Max? I have a sundial in my backyard. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's, that works pretty well most of the time. Um, no, for Apple Watch, I mean, well, what Dana said, you're right. If, if this is regulated as a medical device, it needs a lot more data and a lot more people and I think there's going to be higher levels of scrutiny because how many people have an Apple Watch or would buy one? And the FDA doesn't want, you know, tens of millions of people walking around getting bad data on their heart rate or temperature or glucose levels and then uh, taking health into their own hands or something, you know, uh, injecting sugar cubes into their, their veins or I don't know. Like, <laughs> so Don't do that. Even if you have accurate information, that's something a doctor should handle. So, yeah, um, this is a good example. I mean, I, I can see maybe it's coming. Uh, eventually, like to wearables will get better. But um, I think we also have to be uh, skeptical of the data that can be collected, right? There's a reason that the standard of care is taking a blood sample, right? Um, we can't really do that with like sweat net right now, uh, or other things. So it's going to be more difficult to get the same level of data that we can trust, uh, that isn't going to vary based on, you know, the time of the day or where you're living in the world or whatever, right? There's all these different things that come into play. Or, or even, you know, how tightly you adjust the wristbands, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you know, I mean, it, it could be all sorts of different things. And in order for um, them to, you know, get that clearance, um, you know, so I would assume they'd go through a 510k process. So basically showing that their device works 
um, as well or better than that standard, um, which is, you know, like getting that, you know, th that drop of blood and testing it. Um, and until they can do that, you know, and, and like I said, there have been other technologies, other companies that have tried, um, you know, the contact lens, different um, skin tabs, um, you know, just all sorts of different things. It's, it's hard to do. It's hard to beat the standard. Yeah, and I, I actually, so like this is still far off, but I saw an academic paper earlier this year where uh, they had a micro needle patch. It sounds scary, Dan, but it, you actually don't really feel it. It feels kind of like yeah, Velcro. Well, yeah, wasn't, wasn't that in the Saw movie? Like, do they put it on your <laughs> eye? Like, that sounds terrifying, but okay, I'll take your word. It feels, it. it feels more like a Velcro patch on your skin, but they can design it where it kind of punctures into the right layers of skin uh, and it it samples uh, different, uh, well, it sounds gross, but like liquids in, in like certain layers of fat and skin. And that actually does have important biomarkers. I don't know if we can do like blood sugar necessarily, but uh, it could be used to diagnose other diseases, skin conditions, uh, maybe other things aren't not we don't think and associate with skin conditions. So I could see that maybe being very well, uh, you know, positioned for the form factor of a wearable. Uh, but again, that's an academic paper. So right now it's more like a lab trick, even if the headlines make it seem like it's coming, you know, next month, uh, it's probably many years away if it works at all. But something like that, like we might see some newer technologies evolve. Um, and then that works well with wearables. Maybe Apple could invest in that with all of its money. I don't know. <laughs> it's also a giant leap to go from actionable, helpful information <clears throat> on, let's call it athletic performance or, or functioning. So I wore a Fitbit for years and the Fitbit tracks your sleep. And I found it very useful to see, you know, was it, was I getting the different stages of sleep uh, and mentally, and again, this could be a placebo effect. If it said I had a good night's sleep, it was generally a day I, I felt better. And it seemed to me like it was doing a pretty accurate job. There were a couple of three day weekend cruise trips, Max, where I wore it, where like you'd wake up and you'd be like, I got 98 minutes of sleep and none of it was good. Like, yeah, that, that's about how I feel th this morning. So I think, you're going to see increased things. We, we've already talked about that there's patches that can measure whether you're hydrated up, uh, again, put out by Gatorade. So I, I'm not sure that's the one I would, I would count on. But I think that technology from a, a baseline, even like high school or amateur athlete level uh, is going to be good because you don't need intense information. Like to, you know, you, th there are sort of easy ways to do that. To go to an actual medical device Again, I think there'll be acquisitions. I think Apple wants to do it, but I don't think they're promising that anytime soon. We appreciate how many of you weighed in, jumped in. There's a couple of questions and comments here uh, uh, that we appreciate. Uh, we're not going to grab them. The person who would give money for my napkin sketch, uh, uh, that is Robert Ben Orr. I appreciate that. Uh, I've already gone public via SPAC. Uh, it, it only takes like a couple of hours now. Now, that is a joke. But I will say that when you're investing in some of these SPACs, make sure it's not a joke because some of these companies are. There's a lot of really bad ideas. Like I'm a lifelong media person and the idea of rolling up a bunch of barely profitable, if not unprofitable media companies and buying them time by, by putting them in a SPAC, that's a terrible idea as an investor. That is a great idea if you're, say, BuzzFeed. That is not, or The Athletic, or other places where that are going to have very high expenses and very slim margins. And yes, maybe they could use that money to, to, to automate backends and, and do some things that make them somewhat profitable. But there's certain fields that you're just never going to turn into cash cows. Be very wary when you're buying these companies that are taking shortcuts to go public. Not saying that a SPAC is inherently bad, but as someone who knows the media industry, when you'd be very lucky to make a, an 8 to 10% profit in a year, given that creating content is expensive, um, I would be super duper. Well, there's even like well-known companies that are going public with SPACs that I would still be questioning, like uh, be, I would question, because um, you can project different things in, in a SPAC filing and a, a traditional IPO filing with the SEC. So a lot of times companies going public through SPAC, even if they're well-known like 23andMe or Kinko Bioworks, they just issued this really awesome investor presentation and it makes them look amazing. And then maybe a year from now, they're like, hey, none of that actually came true when they have to actually file you know, SEC filings and things. Uh, so I, I, I personally do not invest in any SPACs. I wait for them to have uh, you know, proper 10Q filings and 10K filings. Uh, I want to see the actual numbers and see them discuss their business before jumping in. I, I have exactly the same philosophy. It is important <clears throat> to point out 
that that is not true of every member of the seven investing team. I would also say it wouldn't be true in my case if it was a company I knew really well on a private basis. So there are some companies that are private that 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 have a lot of disclosures that tell you a lot of information, or maybe you worked there or or whatever it is. So I'm not saying I would never make an exception. But it is very easy for, and I hate to pick on DraftKings, but I think this is one that a lot of people bought sight unseen a, a, as a SPAC um, and say, well, the total addressable market is this. If if gambling was fully legalized, all of this illegal gambling would, would enter this market. And I think that ignores the competition. It actually ignores that we've seen in cannabis, just because cannabis is legal a lot of places doesn't mean illegal cannabis has gone away because in a lot of places it's decriminalized. So it's sort of quasi legal. Um, so I don't think that all these billions of dollars like being bet in like office pools, it, it's not bookies for the most part. It's people doing like, you know, you know, March madness pools with their friends and coworkers. That's not all of a sudden going to go to Caesars or win or, or DraftKings or whatever else it is. It's really easy to make the size of a market sound great, but we've gone totally off the rails. I appreciate Max and Dana being here to talk about healthcare and so many of you weighing in. Uh, I'm pretty sure Dana has to teach a class. So I'm going to say, Sam Bailey, let's bring up our finisher. Which industry do you think is in the most need of disruption? Max, I'm going to sneeze. So I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about uh, that. I couldn't get to the mute button before that happened. Apologies. Max, weigh in here. So All right. So uh, the, the answers were bank, bank, blah, 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 banking, healthcare, insurance, and mortgages. And healthcare ran away with it with 48.7%, followed close, well, not closely, banking, 19.3%, insurance, 18%, mortgages, 13.9%. I've never taken out a mortgage, Dan, so I don't know uh, if that's in need of disruption or not. Somebody on Twitter said, hey, what do you guys, nobody's taken out a mortgage. You guys don't know how crazy this process is. No, it's awful. Yeah. And I will say, having been self-employed at many times during my life, um, it's not set up to reflect your actual income or your actual finances. I would argue that all of these industries need disruption. Banking, I think, is getting it a little more, um, at least for people who are digital savvy. So you are starting to see higher percentage of the country with a bank account. You see commercials for things that have much better overdraft protections. Uh, one of the issues with banking has been people that are you know, living paycheck to paycheck. One overdraft can send them into this spiral of, of multiple charges. I think you're seeing a lot of disruption in that space. On the other hand, you've seen people like T-Mobile try to bring banking you know, to, to people who are unbanked and it hasn't worked all that well. Uh, mortgages, I'd argue nobody has has disrupted it in any way that that you know say like rocket mortgage yes if you work for like a big employer it might uh, automate some of the document process of pulling in you know your pay stubs and things like that but nobody has said Dan has paid a mortgage since he was 22 we have given him that mortgage. Nothing has changed. He's never missed a payment. We are funding that mortgage, so we're not selling it to a government agency, which which triggers all sorts of regulation. You know what? If Dan wants to buy a similar size house to what he, he just had, maybe we'll just give him that money based on his track record. I think that is the disruption that needs to happen. I could very easily borrow $100,000 uh, at credit card-like rates, but certainly I couldn't borrow $300,000 for a mortgage without going through uh, hoops that are impossible to go through. I, I, I don't know that I'll ever deal with a mortgage again is how unpleasant it is. Uh, I would find alternate sources of funding, uh, which is of course not something most people would, you know, most people don't have wealthy family members that can write them a mortgage, which is actually something uh, I, I've done at least once. Uh, Max, health insurance, Health itself, I actually think works mostly okay. Like the hospital system, it's really the payment and the 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 access to healthcare that's the bigger problem. Do you see that being disrupted? Yeah, that's one of those things. That's like a multifaceted problem and needs multiple solutions. I would say dental insurance, Dan. While we're well, as we open the show, <laughs> Tara, you pay like forty bucks a month. It doesn't cover anything. I just spent like two grand on my crowns. Like, what what is my what do I pay insurance for then? You know. Dental insurance is an absolute problem. It's not real insurance. It's, it's a, a scam. It's, it's a discount card. <laughs> um, and, and I'd argue that for the most part, if my dentist said to me, um, hey, for $69 a month, I will cover all of these things, your routine treatments, filling a cavity, uh, maybe you have to pay for materials on certain things. I, I think we will see uh, with dental care, 
some of the disruption that we're seeing with primary care physicians. I mentioned knowing someone that, that started sort of a health co-op. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. We've talked about how big tech is doing that. You are not going to be able to massively disrupt the hospital industry. It, it, Google is not going to go out and set up operating rooms to do you know, organ transplants. Uh, but you might absolutely see, and we're seeing it with COVID, lab testing and other things, uh, they're being spun up at you know, giant distribution centers for some of these huge companies, and they might be able to outsource this. So all of these industries are being in the process of being disrupted, but who knows how it's going to happen because there's just so many layers. There's regulation for all of them. Um, look, a lot of people are going to make money. We've seen payment get disrupted in a lot of different ways. On the other hand, a, a awful lot of payment still goes through old channels. And, you know, it, it's not like Square is doing, you know, the volume that say, you know, a, a, a typical a point of sale company does like, a, like an Intuit. I, I don't actually know the numbers. Uh, so that being said, I think we're going to see a lot more of this. We appreciate all of you being along for our healthcare show. We're going to be back Friday with a full team or most of the team show. Honor Bond probably won't be up yet, but you never know. He could be. He sleeps very strange hours. Uh, we get messages from him at all times of the night. Um, that being said, if you want to get in touch with us, it is info at seveninvesting.com. That is questions about our service, questions about your membership, uh, you know, really anything related to 7investing. If you'd like to interact with us, that's at 7investing on Twitter. And of course, if you would like to get Dana's special report on technology and healthcare, uh, if you're a member, that's available to you. If you are not a member, uh, well, either way, go to 7investing.com and follow the gray box, follow the prompts there and download this absolutely informative report. We'd love to have you do that. Um, Max, am I forgetting anything? Is there anything I'm missing? No, nope. fabulous job, Dan, as always. That is all. We will see you Friday. Thank you, Sam Bailey. Thank you, Max Chatsko. Thank you, Dana Abramovitz. Bye.